All right, I want to bring to the program, uh, hopefully, the uh, next congressperson from the 12th district in California, uh, he, making his return visit to the Majority Report. Uh, Shahid Buttar, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Sam. It's great to be with you. Now, look, I want to start off. Um, I think the last time you were here was, I don't know, maybe at the beginning of the summer. Um, here, I think, sometime, yeah. There was, a, there was a, a piece in The Intercept, I think it was reported other places. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I, but I need to raise it uh, so that we can move on with this. Um, there were a couple of set of accusations. One of them, which was frankly the more serious one, and I think really the peg for the story, fell apart very quickly, even in the context of the story. Um, and I think, you know, we're talking about somebody who I think is a little bit troubled. I don't want to go into that uh, for her sake frankly, more than anything else. But there were other uh, accusations that uh, I think it was by three campaign staffers, um, uh, two women, one man, that you were, you know, like a jerk as a boss. It wasn't, we're not talking, uh, you know, uh, Klobuchar level uh, stories here, uh, but, you know, that you were uh, very demanding, that sometimes you would yell at people, I guess, or not yell, but dress them down uh, in certain situations. Um, now, also in this same uh, report, it was clear that there was a sort of overhaul of your campaign staff. And since that point, things, your campaign has improved by a whole series of metrics that are out there. Uh, but I need to raise it. Some of it people felt was a little gendered. Other people were like, well, you just sort of a jerk to everybody in, you know, that, that were complaining. I've seen, and also let me just add this, um, there was uh, a, you know, a lot of this is, all, all of this was sort of like, there was a, a, a woman named Gloria Berry, who's the chair of the San Francisco Democratic County Central Committee and Black Lives Matter Committee. She came out and basically said like, I think the people who are complaining are a little dubious. I know these people, and it was a bad fit. Um, just to to give both sides, but but I want to give you an opportunity to to say a few words of it, and 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 then we'll move on. And I just want to say to my audience, I've dug into this stuff. With all due respect to you, I wouldn't have you on if I felt that it was um, if there was a, a a real problem here. But I want to give you an opportunity to to just address it. Thank you for that and for raising it. Just to be clear, I take the issues at stake here really seriously because gender matters, race matters, inclusion matters, and ensuring that everybody's respected in the workplace, all those things matter. And I, I particularly appreciate you raising the question. You are literally the first journalist in the nearly two months since these stories reported to even mention Gloria Berry's name. And she's been entirely silenced by the press. This is one of three people recruited by my former staff to participate in which one of those uh, supporters of mine described in text messages that the press has seen and generally suppressed as a smear campaign. And there have been almost half a dozen different accusations, you know, before, uh, and in fact referenced in that Intercept article is a DSA resolution predicated on a false rumor started by my former colleagues that I had a pattern of inappropriate activity with my volunteers. And that fell apart even before that story was ever printed even though it references this DSA resolution that at the time was being promoted by people who knew that the narrative they were presenting in public was false. And then after that was this accusation of harassment by someone who had previously accused me of murder, of human trafficking, the same person had accused any number of people of similar things. The same person had been frankly accused by other people of doing precisely what she said I did to her uh, and this was the person that my former colleagues used to get their concerns about my campaign strategy into the press. And you know, Gloria's voice is one among several that I think is really critical here because the claims about you know, my supposed toxicity in the workplace don't at least align with the experiences of either people who work with me now or any of the volunteers who've been with me long before those former staff joined me. I've been running for Congress for three years among the people who've been critical of me in the press, the longest any of them worked with me was nine months. Some of them only with, worked with me for a few weeks. And you know, these are people who have political motivations. It's unfortunate to me that the press amplified stories without checking the facts. And I'm particularly disappointed if there was a role or a particular part in all this, I'd 
you know, really emphasize there's one group, I've been endorsed by a whole series of organizations here in San Francisco, the SF Tenants Union, Democratic Socialists of America, Progressive Democrats of America, the SF Berniecrats, local members of the school board and the board of supervisors. Every single one of them, with one exception, rescinded their endorsements after these allegations were brought forward. And the only group that stuck by me is the one group that actually did an investigation, which is to say the entire city's progressive establishment presumed the accusations to be true in spite of evidence and witnesses to the contrary. And as a person of color, falsely accused and presumptively judged in public, it is disturbing to me to see self-described progressive and even socialist organizations fail to recognize long established dynamics in our society. And you know, at the end of the day, what the impact of this campaign, uh, the smears towards me has been, is to neutralize the progressive establishment in San Francisco, which frankly, the, the, the institutional part of the progressive establishment from which my former colleagues came and to which they've returned since leaving my campaign, it's always supported Pelosi, but the parts of it that at least did not have taken themselves off the table. So I'm going into this election in November against the sitting speaker of the house with a great deal at stake for our entire civilization and, and every self-described socialist or progressive organization in San Francisco has basically taken themselves off the table, not based on anything I did, but on the presumption that I had done things, all kinds of things. And just to be clear, my former colleagues, in addition to accusing me of this pattern of inappropriate behavior, this supposed harassment by the person whose veracity you know, we've discussed, they've also said, I don't work hard which is just, I mean, it's laughable. I, I'm, I don't even know what to say about that. I'm the first Democrat in a generation to face Pelosi in a general election. And that doesn't happen by me sitting on my hands. Right. Uh, it certainly didn't happen, you know, through the work for, with people who were with me for just a few weeks. I mean, it's the support and the supporters who put me there. And, and maybe the biggest part, I, I, and maybe another thing I'd say here, the, it is very challenging to be dragged in public for things I haven't done, especially as a person of color being subjected to racial and religious tropes. Um, but the, to see the suspension of any commitment to due process or innocence or facts, and instead to presume the legitimacy of any accusation, I think does very dangerous things to our movement. Because while I've been the target of these false claims, it is the movement that's borne the brunt of it. And, and ultimately that's what I'm committed to. I'm grateful for all the support from people who have paid enough attention to examine the facts. And I do want to particularly just note that the failures of the local press to me are especially alarming here. And they're not confined to this story. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, for instance, hasn't debated a challenger in a generation. And that's entirely because the local press hasn't held her accountable. Right. And similarly, the local press here didn't report any facts. They didn't all the text messages documenting that my former colleagues knew they were presenting a false narrative at the time that they were reaching out to the press. All the local press outlets saw those texts and not a single one of them would correct their stories. Even The Intercept, which went back to its story a month after publishing it to basically rewrite the story, didn't issue a correction in violation of their own editorial guidelines. We had to go back to them to get them to just fix the headline. And even the story itself at the first instance, when they first wrote it was internally inconsistent. There's all kinds of fact errors through it. And I just see the crisis in journalism beyond the crisis in race uh, as independent objects of alarm. And I think a lot of people, uh, frankly, have, have paid attention to one layer of this controversy, but- I think, it, listen, you know, my sense is there was also some internal uh, stuff going on at The Intercept, even in that piece. I mean, first of all, if you read that piece from July 23rd, it basically says, here's a person- who is accusing you of something who everyone around them says is troubled, frankly. And that, in fact, you were being accused of something that their former roommate had had happen to them that they had told this person who was accusing you. So the whole thing, that whole element of it fell apart within the story that they're presenting. But that was the tent pole in which the other accusations, which clearly on themselves would not have merited a story, were presented. And to me, the thing, I got to be honest with you, um, it, it, it felt a lot like what happened with Alex Morse. Fortunately for Alex Morse, there was um, a, uh, they, they, they were just more rigorous. And, and, and also, I will say this, 
just totally coincidentally, a big part of why the Alex Morris fell apart was because we got an email from somebody who was uh, periphery to that and ended up being the basis of a lot of the investigations that came out afterwards for the intercept that we handed handed over. And so I think, you know, from my perspective, that made me that much more skeptical about, uh, about that story. And at the very least, um, maybe skip, but I, I, I did some digging around in, in that and, and pursued it. And I think, it, you know, if someone was to spend that time, and like I say, I wouldn't have you on if I hadn't felt confident in, in what I had read there. So, uh, or had, 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 had researched, but okay. So with that for breaking said, your piece in the Moore story, I didn't realize your role there, but, and there is a close similarity. Uh, I don't know if I've, I've been that explicit about it uh, up until this moment, but you know, it wasn't, it was really, you know, we have listeners and we had one who was a student who happened to be up uh, in that area, uh, you know, in one of the schools. And, um, I think uh, if, uh, and, and you know, I, 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 I know reporters and we don't have the ability to report out things, but uh, we, you know, we just hand it off. But uh, you might've just done the same thing with me. I mean, you are the first journalist to even mention Gloria Berry's name. And, and just one, one point of potential correction, she's not the chair of the local democratic county committee, but she is elected to it. She sits on the chair and we met, one of the ways we met was at a, a DCCC meeting about a year and a half ago, where we were both on our feet after one of the members of the DCCC dropped the N-word half a dozen times within 30 seconds. And, and so she understands all too well the long history of race in the city. And she's had very poignant words publicly in response to the accusations made towards me. And, you know, she was uh, in one of the DSA meetings in particular, where just people had the most vicious slander that they were throwing at me. And she wrote publicly afterward that she felt like she just left a KKK rally. Hmm. And this is not something that San Francisco's establishment has grappled with or even considered. Her voice has been entirely suppressed. So just thank you so much for even bringing her into the conversation because the suppression of an Afro-Latino voice that was frankly very close to my campaign saw all the issues that went down, understands that what my former colleagues describe as abuse was simply conflict between a candidate with a strategic vision and a cadre of paid campaign staff who had their own vision and then the idea that after you know I finally got them off the team, moved to more experienced staff who share my vision, and then the folks who I replaced show up months later with this set of stories, you know, shifting stories every week. And she she heard the lies and tried to expose them, and no one was willing to listen to her. And so I appreciate you. At People least can just find it by Googling, and uh, it's it's a medium piece that she wrote. At least you know uh, one of these like uh, there's it, she lays it out uh, quite. Um, uh, convincingly, in my opinion, but let's 